dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. I think leaders often get a bad name. We're portrayed as people whose vision makes us hard, whose clarity makes us intransient. But a Christian leader is called to be something more. The Acts of the Apostles show us St. Peter as a leader who is vulnerable, who is emotionally engaged, and therefore who's even more effective. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be with you again. Let's go ahead and start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. St. John, pray for us. St. Peter, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we've come here today to talk about leadership, right? And to reflect especially on what the Bible can share with us about leadership. And I think, you know, there's no better place to look than the two, you know, the first Christian leader, you know, of course, other than our blessed Savior himself, who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you've got his vicar on earth, who is St. Peter. And the leadership of St. Peter in the, in the Bible, I find especially I don't, illuminative because he is so much like us and facing many of the same circumstances that we face. Um, and, and that, I think, speaks to us about how powerful the Word of God is in our concrete Christian lives. Because, <laughs> let me just kind of get on your case just a little bit. You know, as, as Catholics, most of us are not known for our prowess with Scripture. And I say that to our shame, right? Because it's, we got to remember what St. Jerome said. He said, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. And ignorance of Christ ends up becoming also ignorance of ourselves because we are the members of his body. We have been baptized into him. We have been sealed with Christ at our baptism. And that means that understanding who he is reveals to us our own vocation and our own deepest identity, all right? So when we don't read scripture and we don't understand what he has himself revealed about himself and also about his church and therefore a fortiori about us, right? Then we end up walking in the dark. And when we do that, other voices, other messages, other teachings take the place of God's word. We will always be marching to the beat of some drum, everybody. I mean, you can't sit there and say to yourself, oh no, like I just made up my own life. <laughs> nobody's made up their own life and nobody's made up their own mind. I'm really sorry to tell you that. You have all been taught Somebody out there is teaching you. It's either going to be God or it's going to be someone else. Some rock and roll star, some movie, some book, some, somebody who wanted to get into your brain and that you've simply accepted to get into your brain has got into your brain and told you who you are. It's, it, it's part of like a, a nostalgia in the American world. Somewhere, I don't know how it started, 
But we all want someone else to tell us who we are. And the market uh, economy uh, and free market economy just thrives on that. Because if, if, if I know that people are waiting for me to tell them who they are, by me telling them who they are, I'll have people follow me. It's a, it's a simple principle. And it goes from shoes down to, you know, people, whoever wants to take the stage today gets to have it. And you and I give that the stage of our mind to as many people as claim it more readily than we give it to God. And I think partly it's because, well, we have to read this book that seems so old. You have to read a book. It's, you know, well, listen, today there are podcasts, there are videos. There's all kinds of places out there where you can turn in order to get the word of God and to get it in its power. But you need to open your heart to that word because it is a word that's been spoken to you that reveals the depths of your vocation. And especially if you're a leader, this, this word is essential because as a leader, you have a zone of influence, a corner of influence in this world that God has entrusted to you to work in his name. And the influence that you show and that you give to that world th through your own care and under your own authority, you exercise there in the name of God to bring peace and salvation and the light of truth to it. And so when a leader himself falls flat and no longer exercises that role to all of its depths and with all of its color, well, the world itself grows darker. And I don't think any of us want that to happen, right? The, I think that the, the deep motivation of leadership deep down inside is service. We want to bring other people to the best of themselves. We want to bring peace where there is war and forgiveness where there is injury and healing where there is wound and light where there is darkness and joy where there is sadness. It's just, it's like St. Francis of Assisi's prayer for peace. It's, it's in the heart of all of us. Well, where do you need to turn? You need to turn to your Bible. Okay, so open up your Bibles now. We're going to take a look at Acts chapter 12 today in particular, where St. Peter is in chains. And I simply love this scene because it reveals, I mean, like beyond Peter in chains, like nobody loves seeing St. Peter in chains. This is a big deal. But there's a few points here that are really surprising in this story. Let's go ahead and read it together, right? This is Acts 12. And about that time, Herod the king had laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made for him to God by the church. Violence hits the church again. And this time it strikes right to the head. This isn't the first time Peter's in prison and it won't be his last. He's already been in prison twice before this in Acts alone. In Acts uh, 4, he's in prison and then again with all of the apostles. How does he respond? What does this mean for you and I? Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E -E -E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. Okay, so we're sitting with Peter in prison. And we... I mean, what a spot to be, first of all. You got to like re realize, I mean, the prisons of this time were brutal places. I visited some of them and got to see, it's basically like imagine a cave in the ground 
and then like little holes inside the cave. I mean, this is not a comfortable place to be. And Peter is surrounded by four squads of soldiers. So on the one hand, you can kind of say to yourself, gosh, I guess what a waste of money. You know, I guess Herod really, <laughs> Herod really had a lot of money to throw around because I'd be mean, four squads of soldiers for one prisoner is not exactly efficiency. But he did four squads of soldiers. So you can see this is not looking good for Peter. Feast of the unleavened bread. What happened at the other time? There's a feast of unleavened bread. Our Lord was put to death. So you can see a clear parallel here between Jesus, who himself was imprisoned, and Jesus, who appeared in front of Herod, and now Herod with Peter, and he's already killed James. So this is a, a pretty dramatic situation for the church. James being put to death uh, by the sword, right? And then Peter being held in prison by four squads of guards. This is a moment that a lot of us have felt in our own lives. A, a, a moment of vulnerability. The, the whole church's effort at this point is hanging on its leader, St. Peter. Remember, this is no just an ordinary leader. St. Peter, not only appointed by Christ, having no successor, succession plan <laughs> and having no successor already named, so it has it led the church in an incredible way. The first time he speaks, 3,000 men convert. He, he converts uh, or heals the man who's been lame since birth and the beggar at the beautiful gate. And from that time, 5,000 others then enter the church. The church grows. He's administered to the church already. And then look at the different signs and wonders. And not Ananias and Sapphira come. They lie to him about how much money they give in the church and they drop over dead right in his presence. Now that doesn't mean he didn't kill them, but it, they dropped over dead in the presence of, of him because he's been anointed by God as this leader of the church. Uh, he's been in prison already twice. Watches St. Stephen be stoned. And he's already gone through the great persecution led by St. Paul himself. You know, of course, is Saul, the persecutor. Saul converts. Peter lets Saul back into the church. Saul goes on to convert all kinds of people in the, the synagogues in Damascus. And then again, is engaging folks in Jerusalem. And then he does not forget, he's already raised a lady from the dead. I mean, proving his, his leadership and proving his authority by resurrecting someone from the dead. Could you imagine if that happened today? How powerful that person would be if they, if there's, I mean, and there the people were. The lady was dead. Peter walked in. Her name was Dorcas. And he raises Dorcas, saying to her, Tabitha, rise. Little girl, I say to you, arise. Now, where did he learn that from? From our Lord. When Peter goes and witnesses our Lord's resurrecting of the, of the, the young girl, Jesus says, Tabitha kum, little girl, I tell you, arise. So Peter's there in front of Dorcas, this wonderful woman uh, who has served the church in many ways. And the people are crying and, P and Peter raises her from the dead. Look at the healing of Anus. This beautiful fellow, bedridden for eight years, was paralyzed. He's a grown man, bedridden for eight years. What does Peter do? He heals him with this touching phrase, Anus, Jesus Christ heals you, rise and make your bed. He gives him back the dignity of work, rise and make your bed. And the man does. And immediately he rose, right? Then right after that, he restores Dorcas to life. Then he goes and opens the church to the Gentiles. He himself using his authority, being the very first one to watch the Holy Spirit of God fall upon Gentile converts to Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's opened the whole world now to the kingship of Christ and then went back and convert and, and, and reported back to the church about it. This is a dynamic leader who is expanding the church, expanding the church into the Gentiles, expanding the church into Samaria, expanding the church by, by miraculous signs, 5,000 people converting at his preaching alone, then governing over those people, instituting rules, ordaining the deacons, making moves. 
And so if he can be stopped, then the church could be stopped. This is the logic of Herod. And so the very first thing he does is he demonstrates to Peter that he means business. And he kills James with the sword. In front of Peter, we don't know. But likely Peter saw the death of James. And what's remarkable to me in this story is just what a vulnerable Peter the Bible play, uh, plays out for us. What, throughout the life of St. Peter's leadership, you do not see a harsh tyrant. In Herod, you definitely see a harsh tyrant. Herod killing his enemy with a sword. Herod imprisoning those who were against him. In the Jewish leaders of the time, you definitely saw harsh tyrants imprisoning the apostles, having them flogged, ordering them not to speak again. It's almost like the, the men who are in charge of this world are men who use power and fear in order to bring their opponents down. And with St. Peter, you've never seen power and fear. He, 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 so far, he hasn't demonstrated that at all. Peter's leadership, on the contrary, is a vulnerable one. It's one of bringing people up. And the reason I say vulnerable is because the tenderness and the small little signs here of real compassion reveal a humanity in Peter's leadership that far surpasses anything you see from the, the, the leaders of the world. And there, I think, is a real sign for us because we live, we live in a world where we are nurses, we are doctors, we are our business leaders, and we have the hounds behind us all the time. There are people looking to take our jobs constantly. There are people looking to criticize our businesses constantly. And you know, as well as I do, in the world of business, it's a matter of numbers. You've, you are driven. It's not even like, boy, and yet he's such a nice guy, you know, like, or she's such a nice lady. Being nice doesn't get you very far. It's a matter of how well your numbers performed. And the bigger the business, the more number driven it seems to be. Alas, this is not the way the Catholic business world is supposed to be, by the way. But it's the way it is. And that pressure that's constantly on you to perform, to perform to what other people's standards are, to perform to where it jumped through the hoops that people put in front of you, to be a better and better teacher according to the standards that they put in front of you, right? Can dehumanize the heart. It can make you people who instead of bringing this world up by a human spirit that you infuse through your leadership, actually contribute to bringing the world down, right? Because you end up marching to the beat of the drummer called this world, which is the economy. And beat, marching to the beat of that drummer ends up, can, can rob you of one of the most valuable aspects of leadership. The ability to be vulnerable. The ability to be touched. Leaders can touch others to the degree that they allow themselves to be touched. This is what Peter is going to show us, especially here in Acts 12. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. So Acts 12, P Peter is here in prison. We see prayers being made for him by the church. And look what happens, Acts 12, 6. Herod was about to bring him out on that very night. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. So he was obviously a man that Herod was afraid of. Right? It's, so, it's so funny how there's like a theme here of being in tombs guarded, right? Like when you're already locked up, why would you guard someone who's already locked up, right? Because you're afraid he's going to escape. Well, they did the same thing to Jesus. They put him in the tomb dead and then they posted a guard. Right? They were afraid he was going to escape. Now, Jesus fortunately did. He, he didn't even just escape. He blew the door down. And the same thing happens here with Peter. 
Right, so they have two guards sleeping next to him, sentries at the door, four squads of soldiers, and two chains. And look what happens, verse 7. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Now look at all the tenderness here. I think it's really neat. I mean, it starts a little bit rough. He gets struck on the side. I guess Peter was a heavy sleeper. I don't know what else to say to, to that. But, and then get up quickly. Immediately, the dignity of Peter. Get up. He stands up, reclaims his dignity. And as he stands, the chains fall off his hands. God frees. He stands and then the angel says to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. Now you would think, listen, angel, you just woke a guy up in the middle of the night in the middle of a prison. You just told him to stand up, and he did. If the chains fall off his hands, you can pretty much do anything. And yet the angel, th God does not replace us. God does not overlook humanity. And here in the angel is just a great example of that. Get, get dressed, put on your sandal. And then he's going to tell him to wrap himself with a cloak. Why? To, protect, to put on your sandals, to protect your feet, dre get dressed because that's the, the human mode, right, of acceptance. And then wrap yourself with your cloak because it's a little bit cold outside. And then follow me. Right? In other words, I, even though I'm, I'm going to do a miracle, I'm not going to replace humanity and replace what you need. And then he goes out and they just pass through the thing. Peter ends up realizing, verse 12, when he realized that he had been set free, what does he do? He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. Now we're going to see this John Mark again. He ends up becoming a companion of St. Paul uh, on Paul's first missionary journey. But he's going to turn back uh, about a third of the way through the missionary journey. Later on, he'll become the companion of Barnabas and go back to Cyprus a second time. So he's, this John Mark's a very committed fellow. And there he goes to the house of Mary, John Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying, obviously for Peter, because Peter was going to be put to death the next day. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, there's this beautiful scene where they let him in. And here's the key. Verse 17, but motioning to them, with his hand to be silent. Peter described to the Christian community how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Herod on his hand. Well, after Herod searched for Peter and did not find him in the prison, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. You see the, the, the difference between this tenderness of Peter. What's Peter's one thought while he's in prison? It's to console James upon the loss of his brother. His younger brother had died, was put to the sword. And what's Peter thinking about? Tell these things to James. To tell this to, to his brother. Make sure that James knows that God is faithful. Make sure that James knows that even though we be persecuted and even though we be put into prison, God will not leave him alone. That God, he wanted his own miraculous release from prison to be the consolation of his people. I mean, like, if, if you were released from prison by an angel, you would think to say, like, this means, guys, that I'm just a great leader, right? Follow me. Or this, this means that my plan is going to be really, is gonna, really going to work. Or I, I don't know what you would think yourself. But most of us would not be thinking of other people. We'd be like, do you, can you guys even believe it, you know? And Peter's completely calm. I guess a guy who raised someone from the dead would be rather calm at being released from prison. But it's still such a beautiful heart that he demonstrates. And this is the point. Do you lead from your heart and with your heart? Do the people underneath you See your vulnerability. Are you vulnerable to the people that you work with? 
There's a humanity today that passes through vulnerability that cannot pass through anything else. Uh, the, the world needs and aches for people who are genuinely concerned about them. And that genuine concern will cost us. It will cost us emotional weight. It will cost us extra hassle. It will cost us a lot of... It. And yet at the same time, can you afford not to give it? When your mission is not just to produce, but to lead. If your mission was to produce, you'd be a machine. A leader is not a machine. Herod is a machine. These people don't do their job. I will kill them. And he led with fear. And he led through money. But where did he lead them to? You know, I mean, like, you think, oh, man, the power of Herod. I don't think Herod was nearly as powerful as St. Peter. I don't think Herod had neither the, nowhere near the follow, followership as St. Peter. He didn't have near the dedication of his people. St. Peter led through love. From the tenderness that he shows throughout his life to the positivity and the encouragement that he gives every step of his leadership, he grows the church by being its father. Now, obviously, that's limited in the business context and in the professional world, obviously. But it doesn't have to disappear. And it certainly mustn't disappear from your family. How powerful it is. Can anything replace the witness of a father and a mother? Let them see your heart. And your heart will let them see God. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.